Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eighth annual ASU <laughs> Women's Studies Symposium. My name is Dr. Devonna Mallory. I am the chair of the ASU Gender Studies Committee. This year's theme is Still We Rise. And uh, thank you for being here. This day will be jam-packed with, uh, with different panels and presentations. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, we are going to start off with the chair of Eng English, Modern Languages, and Mass Communication, Dr. James Hill. I think it's okay. Good morning. I'm pleased to be asked to uh, welcome you to the 8th Annual Women's Studies Symposium. I want to congratulate, uh, again, the Women's Studies, uh, Gender Studies Committee, uh, Dr. Mallory as chair, Professor Alvira Watson, Dr. Gosden, Dr. Diamond, Dr. Hankerson, Dr. Lambert, Dr. McKinney, uh, Dr. Proctor and Dr. Andre uh, Rosenbaum Andre. It is critical, I think, that this effort continues. Uh, like Black History Month, Women's History Month began as Women's History Week in uh, 1982. And uh, in 1987, as a result of a bill passed by Congress petitioned by the Women's History Project, Women's History Week became Women's History Month. And <clears throat> we are hopeful that uh, the celebration of women's history in the month will continue to unearth, uncover the many, many contributions of women to the fabric of American society. So again, I'm pleased to welcome you and hope that we have a successful conference. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. McKinley, and I would like to introduce our first presenter. She's an English major in her senior year uh, here at the ASU. She's a senior director of the United ASU Gospel Choir and is also a tutor in the Writing Center. She aspires to be a writing specialist here at the ASU, and the title of her paper is while they weave, an analysis of the weave of theme in various texts and a film. Uh, please let's welcome Miss Brandy Johnson. Thank you. Um, again, the title of my presentation is While They Weave, an analysis of the weaving theme in various texts and a film. Weaving has been known as a pastime or a hobby for many years in many cultures. In most cultures, weaving is practiced by women. This idea of weaving is employed in many stories and movies, such as Alice Walker's Everyday Use, Terry McMillan's Quilting on the Rebound, Barbara G. Walker's revision of The Emperor's New Clothes, and writer and director, director Mohsen Makhmobov's film, Gabe. The female characters in these pieces practice weaving in various ways and under different circumstances. However, the weaving theme is explored in the same ways in these pieces. In these stories and film, the reader or audience witnesses women from different cultural backgrounds affected by their cultures and <coughs> societies, which cause them to partake in weaving in some form or another. Two ways that the reader or audience sees weaving working in these stories and film are a source of empowerment and or strength in regards to McMillan's quilting on the rebound and Mokmobov's Gabe and a sense of identity in Walker's everyday use and B. Walker's The Emperor's New Clothes. In Terry McMillan's quilting on the rebound, the central female character, Marilyn, experienced loss on two accounts when she miscarries her child and her fiance decides that he is not ready for marriage. Unable to fathom her circumstances, Marilyn begins quilting, according to the text, again. 
In this way, Quilting on the Rebound explores the weaving theme as a source of empowerment and or strength. Marilyn is obviously weakened by the loss of her child and her future husband, and quilting allows her to take back the power Richard, her fiancé, takes from her. Marilyn narrates, quote, It occurred to me that I wasn't suffering from heartache at all. I actually felt this incredible sense of relief, end quote. In this instance, the reader sees the transition from hurt to relief that Marilyn experiences as a result of her quilting. McMillan tells the story of many women in Quilting on the Rebound, a story that almost every woman has the chance to tell at some point in her life, and weaving is very important to this story. The point that McMillan makes through Marilyn's story of loss and heartbreak is that it is important to find some sense of release and relief after heartbreak, a healthy release that provides relief <coughs> and eventually eventually leads to happiness with one's self as a woman, particularly a single woman. It is evident that Marilyn gains strength from quilting because it makes her strong enough to not only be content without Richard, but it also creates space for her to embark on new journeys and ultimately be able to say, quote, basically, I'm doing everything I can to make Marilyn feel good, end quote, in the end. Mosin Makmobal util utilizes the weaving theme very similarly in his 1996 film, Gabe. Gabay tells the story of a young woman named Gabay who is consumed with the idea of marriage and is discontent and disheartened by her father's wishes for her to wait to get married. The audience sees Gabay and the other women of her culture weaving throughout the film for what appears to be a hobby or pastime. However, it can be concluded that Gabay weaves for a personal purpose, strength. Throughout the film, Gabay laments the day of her pending marriage, the delay of her pending marriage. However, the audience is made aware that Gabay does eventually marry due to magical realism through which Mahmoud allows viewers to see Gabay and her husband after they have grown old together as they reminisce on how they met and ran away together. Gabay weaves through the anger and hurt that is bestowed upon her by her father and although she is disheartened and discouraged, she continues to weave with vibrant colors which according to the film symbolizes love and life. However, Gabay witnesses death when her younger sister goes missing and dies after jumping off of a cliff to rescue a goat. Upon this experience, Gabay is very much saddened and she weaves, but in black this time, which symbolizes death. Upon meeting her future husband, Gabay and he grow very impatient and he pleads desperately for Gabay to run away with him, yet she still weaves. The audience can conclude that Gabay's weaving allows her to think things through and muster up the courage and strength to run away with her love. Gabe is able to empower herself after being oppressed by her father for so many years. Not only does weaving provide women with strength and empowerment, but it also creates a space for them to identify themselves. In Alice Walker's Everyday Use, the reader sees a struggle for self-realization and self-acceptance. The weaving motif in this text is represented by quilting. In Mama, Maggie, and Dee's home, quilts symbolize their African roots and freedom from slavery, hand-stitched by Dee and Maggie's grandmother from her old dresses. However, Dee does not appreciate the quilts indicated when Mama recalls when she had tried to send Dee off to college with one of the quilts, and Dee called them, quote, old-fashioned, out of style, end quote. It is evident that Dee struggles to accept who she is as an African-American through her constant attempts to negate her heritage and upbringing. Because she chooses to be educated and live a more liberated life, she feels that the past is no longer relevant, thus, in her mind, creating a different identity for herself. However, Dee has a change of heart when she comes home to visit with her new boyfriend, Hakeem. She goes to the trunk at the end of the bed, digs out the old quilts, and asks Mama, can she have them? It is not made clear whether or not Hakeem, who is an African Muslim, influences Dee's change of heart. What is important is the fact that Dee does come to a point of self-actualization -actual after so many years of denying who she is. In this way, weaving serves as a sense of identity and Walker's everyday use. Although a slightly different piece, Barbara G. Walker's version of The Empress's New Clothes explores the same idea of identity through weaving. Weaving is represented by dressmaking in The Empress's New Clothes. This tale tells the story of two sisters who deceive many people and make a profit off of their clever trickery. They manage to deceive a host of people, including the Empress, and make a great deal of money. The idea of identity is found through dressmaking or weaving in this piece because the women so strongly desire to be rich and successful, but their true identities are not discovered until the end when they are exposed. Although the women's intentions are not pure, there is a sense of innocence that is present in their actions because obviously they lack knowledge of self-identity and quite frankly, their idea of identity is distorted. 
is it is obvious that the sisters associate identity with the superficial aspects of life, wealth, and success. Their actions are, in a sense, innocent because they come from an inward space of needing to feel important or that they have worth or value. After managing to fool the empress, the sisters are exposed by a child who innocently points out that the empress is naked and not clothed in the finest silk that only the innocent and morally pure can see. This instance proves the dressmakers are fraudulent. However, the empress forgives them and employs them as her personal stylist. Through this, the women are allowed to identify themselves by their knowledge and skill through their dressmaking or weaving and use their gifts and talents for good. One of the points that is made through this tale is that identity does not come from worldly possessions, but it is what one, particularly a woman, possesses on the inside that makes up her identity. The theme of weaving, weaving is very common, although often overlooked. As discussed, weaving can be represented by many things such as quilting and even dressmaking. For many years, women have been oppressed, depressed, and struggled with their identities. However, texts such as Quilting on the Rebrown, Everyday Use, The Empress's New Clothes, and films such as Gabe suggest an outlet, weaving. Weaving in a woman's own way can create a space for her to gain strength and empowerment during adverse times and provide her with a sense of self. Thank you. Thank you, Randy, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our second presenter. She is Dr. Geneva Diamond. She is an English professor in uh, the English Modern Language and Mass Communication Department. She teaches a variety of English courses, among them uh, British, British literature. And her two are of research are uh, medieval and popular romance. Please let's welcome Dr. Geneva Diamond, and the title of her presentation is The Rise of Multi Multiculturalism in the Popular Romance. Hi, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to speak on the rise of multiculturalism in popular romance. I don't know, how, am I carrying well? Is, is it coming through? Okay. Um, I study early medieval uh, romance, British romance, and romance is a genre. My interests are actually very longitudinal um, and cross genre. And so by studying medieval romance, I became interested in popular romance in American culture. Now, romance has always been the sort of best-selling genre um, from the end of the Hellenistic period until the beginning of the Renaissance period, which is about 1,700 years. The mo single most copied manuscript was the Alexander Romance. It was copied into more languages than any other manuscript. If you reduce that time period to just the Christian era, the Alexander Romance comes in second only to the Bible. So romance as a genre has always been hugely popular, but it's been divided into literary romance and popular romance. Literary romance is things like Mallory's Death of Arthur, which you have to study when you take class with me. It also contains things like Shakespeare's comedies, Jane Austen's works. That's considered highly literary. On the other hand is popular romance, which is produced for mass consumption. Popular romance is also connected to uh, novels of domestic fiction, uh, which have to do with the life inside the home rather outside of the home. It's the popular romance that scholarship has always denigrated. It's popular romance at th throughout the 1700 years, oh well, 17, 15, now 2,500 or so, 2,500 years of history of the genre. Um, popular romance becomes associated with women readers in the Renaissance and later with w women authors and becomes denigrated. One of the ways that we can see that denigration is that popular romance, which are like romance novels, go by the Harlequins and read those. Popular romance has been studied 
seriously since the 1980s. The first scholarship on popular romance novels was written by Janice Radway's, Janice Radway. And it's called Reading the Romance, Women, Patriarchy, and Popular Literature. From that title, you can easily see that that is a feminist reading of popular romance. And Radway took it basically practice ethnography. She went to one town where they had one bookstore, and in that bookstore they had one women's group that sort of met monthly and, and talked about the novels they liked to read. From those, I think, 41 women, Janice Radway developed her theory, which was that women read popular romance novels as a way to compensate for the um, emptiness of their own lives and that it was basically they, they, women think that they're sort of getting away from the patriarchy, but they are in the end being controlled by it. That foundational scholarship has colored the scholarship on romance novel all the way through. It finally, scholarship has finally started to change um, and basically stopped trying to make very big pronouncements about um, the, the field and the readers. Nonetheless, it is still viewed, romance novels are still viewed as very white. Majority of, of readers are white. Majority of authors are, are white. Very heterosexual. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I receive a, a Twitter feed, um, which I'll, I'll change the name of the actual Twitter feed, stuff, we'll say stuff, academics say. Mm -hmm. And um, at Valentine's Day, one of their, their tweets was, roses are red, gender is performative, mass market research is heteronormative, <laughs> and, which I just, I just loved it. Um, so the idea that mass market romance or popular romance is heteronormative, patriarchal, it still is embedded in scholarship. That scholarship does not recognize that there has been a very strong push towards multiculturalism in romance novels, in the writing of them. And what I was going to do was just sort of survey what those changes are and possibly offer some, some comment on where that push is coming from. So, one reason that popular romance is, is seen as just sort of, it's seen as monolithic, it's not changing. And so people will still talk about romance novels as being bodice rippers, which is a very 1980s phenomenon and is, is not uh, so much true anymore. If I had, I didn't make my pictures, so you can't see the, the great Fabio covers of the 1980s. But the field of romance is changing, especially in identity categories. So the, um, the way that they're viewed, romance novels are viewed as normative along lines of class, power relationships, race, se sexual expression, and gender. Now those things are changing quite a bit. And they tend to be due to two things. First of all is authorial pressure, and second is audience demand. So under authorial pressure, we have authors whose pen names are like Courtney Milan, Eloisa James, Jade Lee. And, and those are not the real names, but they're actual pen names. Eloisa James is actually Mary Bly, who is a PhD professor and daughter of, I think, Robert Bly. Um, but because of her background, she herself is, is steeped in what we teach as an academic, and so, what she writes is influenced by her professional life as well as her personal life. Courtney Milan, I believe, was a, is, was a lawyer, clerked for a couple of Supreme Court justices uh, before she retired. So again, her, personal prof her professional life brings a different sensibility uh, to her writing. Jade Lee is the daughter of She's, she's descended from parents, one parent from Shanghai, and I'm sorry, I forget, but an, an American parent. So she's biracial. <clears throat> this means that as authors, as, as the uh, identity of authors becomes more inclusive, 
those authors write about their own experiences, and that brings multiculturalism in. Uh, Beverly Jenkins, who just visited this past weekend, um, as an African-American author, I think she, 20 years ago, was her first novel, and she writes and speaks about how difficult it was for her as an African-American author to break into publishing. But she basically did what all romance authors do. She wrote about herself and the kinds of characters that she wanted to see. So that's the first factor. The second factor is reader demand. Um, one of the quotes I have from Publisher Weekly, from Julie Naughton in 2014, said that publishers are now responding to diverse books for diverse readers. As, um, and she said, especially what she pointed out was that uh, multicultural readers, uh, multiracial readers, are demanding more from publishers. Um, because the, the reading public is demanding more, the publishers respond. The first major publisher to publish um, a romance novel by an African American author was in 1980. Ros Rosalind Wells was the first mainstream publication. The 1990s saw a huge upsurge, and that was basically in. in oddly still seen as category as a subdivision of romance, um, but the 1990s saw that upsurge in um, romance fiction written by African American women. This, the, last, the last area of identity that's just now, I, I'd say within the past decade or so, seen an upswing in publication is on orientation. And so, Len Barrett. Len Barrett um, is an author who was a, a surgeon, a gay woman, and she could not get her works published, so she started her own publishing house, which is called Bold Strokes Books, and she now has 140 authors in, in her publishing business. So a lot of it is just people sort of taking control, and self-publishing has become much easier. Uh, through online publishing, and so people are just putting their stuff out there. The, the one area that remains really controversial within the romance community is um, what's called male-male romance novels. Those are supposedly, notice I say supposedly, um, gay male romance novels, but they are written primarily by straight female authors and they are read primarily by straight female readers. And, and it's, this, it's connected, uh, Dr. Rosenbaum can tell me if I have the term correct, it's connected to slash fiction. Yes. Yeah, it's connected to slash fiction where fans take characters from whatever uh, entertainment that they're into and queer the characters. I knew about this because uh, I always watched um, Supernatural, and that there's a subset of slash fiction associated with Supernatural that's called Winchest. Um, that the two characters are, are brothers, who, uh, their last name being uh, Winchester, and slash fiction has queered their relationship. And the show, the television show, actually referenced that in a, in, in a very sly way. So uh, I was aware of the slash fiction, but this male male sort of subset of romance novels seems to be connected with, with, that, with that phenomenon. And it's very controversial. Some gay readers are fine with it, and some see it as complete eroticization and, and uh, appropriation. And that it's basically, and I've read very few of them. My research centers on historical romance. Um, which is romance set in, in a historical period. And, a, and the vast majority of especially um, gay, lesbian, um, bisexual, and trans fiction tends to be um, contemporary, set in a contemporary period. But I have seen and read a couple of Regency, male, what are called male-male romances. And they're, they're more stereotypical and, and just more, to me, strange 
than what would be called the heteronormative romances because they're just taking tropes and placing them on male characters. They're, and so I can understand where many people are actually very upset about them. Um, and while well, others aren't, they're, they're very strongly divided um, in the, the community over that. So, again, I think the, the lesson from this rise of, of a lot of different types of romance is that it's basically market driven. And as soon as, rom as romance publishers see that they can make money off of it, they're going to make money off of it. And one of the things I've been seeing on um, Twitter is people like Courtney Milan, people like Jade Lee, sending out tweets constantly challenging their readers. Uh, there was one about two, three weeks ago where a challenge was put out for every heteronormative romance novel that you as a reader buy, go buy one that's multicultural. And so the authors are pushing this and the readers are demanding it and it just becomes a matter of time before publishers respond because they're going to make money any way they can. So that's it. Any questions? We're good. Beverly Jenkins come on Saturday, yeah. right? For everybody who missed it, yes, and which was phenomenal. How would you say she contributed? What what more can she do? Because I know that she increased. What more she, could she do? Or how did she do? How did she contribute? Both. Um, she contributed by she's not the first author, right? Um, but she sold so well. Um, she's on her thirty second book in twenty years, and if someone's going to sell that much, publishers are going to respond. Right. They're going to get more authors to feed that market. Uh, all you have to do is go to Walmart and go to the section of romance novels and there's actually a specific section of, it depends on what they call it, African American, some of them call them urban. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, Beverly Jenkins tends to write historicals, which is more what I read and study. But a lot of what they call urban are very, you know, they're set in contemporary period. If, um, if there's like someone here who wants to be a roommate, what should they do? What has not been covered yet? I'm telling you, if you can, if you can dream it, it's been published. Really? Oh, uh, yeah. And especially at that low end, what I consider that low end self-publishing, free ebook off of Amazon. Mm -hmm. If you can dream it, it's been done, really. Um, shifters, like the bear, werewolves I kind of get, but bear shifters, aliens, uh, time traveling, gay, Vikings, illegal immigrants. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think that that's, that actually, would be very easily fit into a romance novel right. because the marriage of convenience. Right. I, for I'm, the, for the, I'm claiming it. I'm just right now. <laughs> that's it, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just, and then that's the thing, romance novels are very much ruled by tropes. Okay. And so, and so the, the creativity tends to come, or the change, the unusualness tends to come when people apply those tropes to either different circumstances, like take the tropes of the uh, arranged marriage from um, the, re the Regency period and apply it to something now. Right. I actually just read a major market, uh, major publisher um, release. One of the tropes of the Regencies is the bride won in a gambling event. So like you play a game of cards, you're out of money, you bet your daughter. Uh, oh wow. That, that's a trope. I actually okay. read one where a father bet his son. And oh. so the son had to marry the heroine because he was won by her father in a game of cards. So it's like, that's, that's where the changes awesome. come. It's right. taking those tropes and applying them in different ways. Hmm. That's very cool. It was fun. Actually, that one wasn't bad either. <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank you. Okay. Um, what? Um, since there, Romance is an area where you stood.
students can apply skills, but they can also make money. It's what? They can make money and they can apply skills. What did they say in the film? One of the authors said she got tired of making $6,000 a year. Mm -hmm. They don't make that much money. Courtney, <clears throat> Courtney Milan has gone to total self-publication because it's the only way she can make enough to live on and not have a side job. Eloisa James is still a professor and she writes on the side. Uh, Dana Gabaldon, uh, who wrote Outlander, she's made enough that she was able to quit her. Uh, she was a research scientist and professor. She, she was able to quit her day job. But I, the last time I saw anything about it, the average payout for, this is average, not the people at the top, but the average payout for a romance novel is three to $4,000 per novel. Really? Yes. So not that much. People at the top make more. Yeah, yeah but the average is, now, you can do something like write your own fan fiction, have it take off, have someone buy it from you, next thing you know, you've got shades of gray. Right. Oh, that was such a bad. That was, that was <laughs> awful. But that's one of those one-off kind of things that you just can never replicate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the money, there's not that much money, but it's like all publishing. 